my name's Anna Suleiman. I'm a postdoc in the School of Public Health, and I'm really honored to be here with all of the faculty that are here today. I'm a little intimidated, but it's going to be OK. Um, I just want to say also I'm sad that um, Dean Bertozzi left because he said at the very beginning that he wasn't sure that there was a lot from neuroscience that we could integrate, and I'm hoping that in the next couple of talks we can actually make an argument for some of it. In the United States, by the time that young people leave adolescence, by the time that they, are, they leave their teenage years, by the time they're 19 years old, the overwhelming majority have been involved in at least one, sex, uh, one romantic relationship, and 71% of them have become sexually active. Research demonstrates that these first romantic relationships are really important in adolescents learning important skills related to relationships, romantic experiences, and also building their sexual identities and their sexual experiences. Now, we all know that sexual socialization or somebody's interest in their in sexual um, opportunities doesn't happen uh, magically at puberty. It's actually a lifelong journey that begins at birth through which people develop attitudes, beliefs, behaviors, and values that are related to sex, sex and sexuality. But some critical development does occur at adolescence that is related to building an increased interest in attraction to and desire for the highly intense and arousing sensations associated with having your first kiss, imagining your first crush, or engaging in your first romantic relationship. As this quote highlights, adolescence is not for the faint of heart. The to-do list for the first decade of life between 10 and 20 includes separating from your parents, finding your place among your peers, at school, beginning to make decisions about your own future, and oh yes, figuring out how to relate to the world and yourself as a suddenly and mystifyingly sexual being. Understanding one's sexual identity is, a, is complex, and it's a major component of normal adolescent development. In recent years, there's been extensive interest in both the popular media and the research community about the link between adolescent brain development and adolescent behavior. From this, we've been able to identify adolescents from pre-puberty, nine to 10 years old, through the third decade of life, as a window of neural flexibility or plasticity, when both the physical structure and the functional organization of the brain change. During this time, important changes occur in the brain associated with rational, emotional, and social processing. Neural flexibility coupled with the hormonal shifts that occur at puberty has a significant influence on romantic and sexual behavior. As the onset of puberty stimulates an increased interest in romantic and sexual behavior, it also increases a significant desire for exciting, rewarding, and emotionally charged experiences. This adaptive development facilitates adolescents in becoming more independent from their parents, building new social relationships, and gaining a better understanding of who they want to be in the world. At the same time, these highly exciting and stimulating things that adolescents want and like to experience can also result in them making some really negative choices that have negative health outcomes. The majority of the individual level interventions, and we've talked about the problems with them some today, that we have designed to improve adolescent sexual health outcomes seem to do a decent job of changing adolescents' beliefs, attitudes, and knowledge about sexual behavior, but they have had a very limited effect on changing health behaviors or health outcomes. Neuroscience does offer some suggestions about why our primarily cognitive-based interventions continue to fall short. Two key regions of the brain undergo significant transformation during adolescence that I'm gonna talk about today. The first is this purple region, the prefrontal region, which is associated with the ability to control one's thoughts or actions. For a long time, we had this story that under development of this prefrontal region that was sort of our executive control center of our brain was the reason that adolescents made the decision to take so many risks. Recent behavior and brain imaging studies have helped us understand that while adolescents have often been thought of as irrational and unable to engage this part of their brain, 
By mid-teen years, 15 to 16 years old, we know that in calm, cool, neutral situations, adolescents make decisions very similar to adults. What is different about adolescents is that in highly emotionally charged situations, they're willing to take risks. And we know now that this is due to development that's happening also in the subcortical limbic region of the brain, this green region. This is, region of the brain is involved in understanding and navigating social situations, processing rewards, experiencing empathy, social acceptance, and social rejection. This development allows young people to want and like new and exciting experiences. Now, as Dean Bertozzi did say, we don't need a brain scan to know that peers influence adolescent sexual and romantic behaviors. Having sexually active peers has been shown to increase positive attitudes towards sexuality, decrease the age of sexual debut, increase sexual activity, and increase the number of sexual partners. Clearly, peers have a strong effect on romantic and sexual behaviors. So how can neuroscience add to our understanding of adolescent sexual decision making? Important brain development that allows adolescents to become more empathetic, aware of the world around them, and sensitive to peer interactions. The presence of peers, or even the suggested presence of peers, activates the reward circuitry in the brain for adolescents in a way that does not happen for children or for adults. This, in the scanner, this activation looks like enhanced activity in the ventral striatum, which is often referred to as the reward center of the brain. Jason Chen and Larry Steinberg's lab clearly demonstrated this when they compared the brain activation of adolescents, young adults, and adults when they were completing a driving simulation task. And they looked at how often people would run yellow lights, which they called risky decisions, and also the number of crashes that they had when they were, the number of accidents that they would get into. You can see from the graphs that when people were alone, and you can see these in the blue bars here, adolescents behaved very similarly to the other two groups. But when adolescents were told that a peer would be watching them from the scanner control room, suddenly, which you can see from the red bars, adolescents got, started making many more risky decisions. They ran a lot more yellow lights, and they also got into a greater number of crashes. Since this task was being completed in the scanner, we were able to see that the activation of the ventral striatum, or that reward center of the brain, was really activated in adolescents as soon as they were told that their peers were going to be present. Thinking about this in the context of romantic behavior, activation occurs in the reward processing part of the brain when adolescents engage in romantic experiences. That can be friending somebody on Facebook, holding someone's hand, thinking about engaging in a kiss. And now we know that for adolescents, this is even more enhanced by the presence of the peer that they are romantically interested in, and potentially by other peers, if they're doing this in a public setting, or if they think that their friends might find out later about their behavior. This enhances the potential for novel, exciting, and romantic and sexual experiences to feel even better and more rewarding for adults than they do for adolescents. Given that romantic and sexual experiences are inherently social behaviors, it is critical to understand the role of peer influence. When thinking about explicit peer pressure around adolescent romantic and sexual behavior, while thinking about explicit peer pressure is not a new concept, Based on the neuroscience, I became interested in learning if adolescents' narratives about their early romantic and sexual experiences mirrored the subtlety that was suggested by this activation in reward processing. To look at this, I interviewed 40 adolescents between the ages of 15 to 19 years old, and I asked them about their early sexual and romantic experiences. The interview guide that I used did not explicitly ask about peer influence. It was not something that I was looking for when I started. And yet, uniformly, 100% of the participants started talking about the influence that their peers had on their early and romantic and sexual experiences. Well, very few of them talked about explicit peer pressure, and it was actually a very small number of them. The majority of the uh, discussions talked about the subtle ways in which peers influenced and motivated their behavior. As youth shared their narratives, they talked about the social norms that emerged, especially around middle school, to be in romantic relationships. 
These perceived norms encouraged adolescents to be in early relationships. For example, they said, I think that what was interesting about relationships was that like everybody wanted one. So just the fact that everybody wanted to have one was exciting. And they also talked about how romantic relationships would help them increase their social status among their peers. When everybody knew you were, had a girl or a girlfriend or you were in a relationship, I guess you felt like prideful, like, oh yeah, I got a girl and it's something to feel good about. So while youth were undergoing the pubertal transition where they were increasing their wanting and liking for high intensity sensations associated with romantic and sexual experiences, they were also getting clear social messages that being in a relationship was a positive thing. Once they moved into engaging in relationships, they continued to be significantly influenced by their peers. For, you, for example, youth often described getting into early relationships because they wanted to avoid hurting or offending someone if they declined to go out with them. They were interested in me, and it's kind of like the reason that I decided to. I just didn't want to say, no, I don't like you back, because I didn't want to hurt any feelings. Through these narratives, the adolescents that I talked with talked about the complex ways in which peers had motivated their interest and behavior in both romantic and later sexual relationships. They described both positive and negative effects their, positive, their, their peers had on their decisions. And what struck me most was that most of the time when I turned off the recorder, they began to reflect on how surprised they were to hear how influenced they were by their peers. I recognize I was asking them to craft a narrative that matched with their experiences, but consistently the role of peers was really relevant for them. From the results of these interviews, I began thinking about the complexity of peer influence on early adolescents and wanted to explore how adolescents' implicit attitudes might be influenced by their peers. I was interested in whether peers had the ability to change attitudes that we ourselves are not even aware of. To this end, I developed an implicit association task for mild sexual behaviors. The implicit association task has often been used to measure attitudes that may differ from what people cognitively believe and or verbally articulate to be true. And these implicit attitudes have been found to be more predictive of behavior than explicit attitudes. For example, they've been used in youth to look at bullying behavior, binge drinking, and other social attitudes such as racism and homophobia. If you're not familiar with an implicit association task, it's a really simple computer task. You, a participant sits at the computer, they have one finger on an I key, one finger on the E key of the, computer, of the keyboard, and two categories appear in opposite corners of the screen. The task measures the difference between how quickly and accurately the participant associates the target words that you see in the middle of the screen with the two different categories. In this study, we had girls ages 10 to 14 years old, and we looked at their positive and negative associations with words describing mild romantic behavior, like hug, kiss, holding hands. Building on what we knew about the effects of peers on explicit romantic attitudes and behaviors, I wanted to explore if the presence of peers would affect implicit attitudes. In a cross-sectional pilot study, 75 girls were randomized to complete the IAT alone, in the presence of peers, or after having watched a clip of Glee, the TV show Glee, <laughs> where the salience of, of public displays of infection was really highlighted. What we found was that there was no significant difference between the group's implicit attitudes related to romantic behavior. I want to clarify that this was a very preliminary exploration of this approach, and much more work is needed to really understand these, these results. But at the same time, when I think about the potential meaning of these results, it points to an inner interesting opportunity for intervention if implicit attitudes, which are targeted by very different intervention strategies than explicit attitudes, are more stable in the presence of peers. While this is behavioral data and not scanner data, further exploring the link between implicit associations and brain activation related to peer influence is promising. So how can we best integrate this information from developmental neuroscience into public health interventions aiming to improve sexual health outcomes? These are definitely complex, layered problems that require us coming up with new questions and looking for new answers. We need to develop transdisciplinary teams committed to working on large longitudinal studies. While the challenges are formidable, investment in networks like 
Innovations for Youth, or the Emerging Center on the Developing Adolescent offer a foundation for building these critical transdisciplinary teams. And in the meantime, I think that there are opportunities for us to take advantage of this knowledge now. First, as I said about earlier, we need to reframe our approaches to adolescent sexual health interventions. Too often, sexual and romantic behavior is framed as risk-taking, when in fact it is a cornerstone of normal adolescent development. I agree that we need to develop interventions that, and strategies that minimize the negative health outcomes of these behaviors, but we need to approach sexual development as a normal process. We also need to be creative about developing interventions that integrate our understanding of the social, emotional, and cognitive development that occurs during adolescence. Interventions based on cognitive behavior change theories will continue to fall short. Last, we need to expand our, peer, our framework for understanding peer context and peer influence, including the effect of peers on implicit attitudes. Peers are not just contributing to the external environment under which adolescents make romantic and sexual decisions, they are fundamentally changing the neural activation involved in that decision making. While we need additional research to better understand this peer effect, our interventions need to creatively provide opportunities for adolescents to learn strategies to address the subtle effects of peer influence. On one hand, it can be viewed as worrisome, especially for parents and people working with young people, that young people are uniquely influenced by peers at a time when they are also most motivated to seek out high intensity and high sensation experiences. And on the other hand, that's part of what makes adolescence so powerful. As young people move into this period of neural flexibility that allows for spectacular transformation, may we accept the challenge of maximizing this opportunity and developing truly in innovative interventions.